Navy SEAL turned author Jack Carr delivered The Terminalist, unleashing James Reese, one of the most lethal protagonists the thriller world has ever seen. Then, he made us all true believers by following up his explosive debut with a sequel that was as emotionally complex as it was action packed. It was immediately clear Jack Carr was not your ordinary talent. With his third novel, Carr will unveil the tale he has dreamed about writing since childhood when he first read Richard Connell's seminal short story, The Most Dangerous Game. Over the decades, the story has grown and evolved as other great works informed Carr's brutal vision. From Jeffrey Household's Rogue Mail to David Morrell's First Blood to Louis L'Amour's The Last of the Breed, resulting in a novel that is both evocative of those works and altogether original. James Reese is lured to a remote island to be hunted by a dangerous adversary. The man soon learns that men like Reese are not prey, but rather the most dangerous predator to stalk the earth. From the rugged yet dangerous beauty of Montana to the untamed and frigid wildness of Siberia, there is nowhere to hide from Jack Carr's savage son. Gents, cool. let's raise a glass. We got Jack Carr in the house. Hey, hey. Thank you guys for Good having me on. You again. Sincerely appreciate it. You betcha. Dude, it's awesome to have you here with us again. Mm -hmm. uh, this time we're talking Savage Sun. Yes. Your latest blockbuster hit shelves tomorrow, folks. April 14th. Yeah. So, Jack, why don't you give the audience a glimpse of what's in store for James Reese in Savage Sun? Well, I shall, but first off, uh, well, thank you for having me on, but I'm curious, am I the first repeat guest? You are, mm. you are the second, but oh, the man. timing of your book. <laughs> Look at his timing. Dang. It's all Granny's about timing, book brother. came out um, before yours, so, so he was- So you had him twice? Yeah, well, the government screwed you on this one, so it's not your fault. Ah, it's all right. <laughs> yeah, that's you all would have right. been twice. Yeah, I was yes. going to be so excited, if now I'm not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but but so, listen- No, no, guys, technically he is, because he was on the show to step you're in- You're our first three-timer. So he's three times now. He's, yeah, you're, you're our three first three-timer. Three three I'm going to go with that. Yeah. 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 I like that. Three times right. a charm. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right. So yeah, Savage Sun is Gee. the one that I've been wanting to write since sixth grade. Wow. Uh, when I first read The Most Dangerous Game by Richard Connell, 1924 short story. And I knew that one day I would write a novel that paid tribute to that short story. And uh, it's the one I actually wanted to write first when I had six, seven, eight different one page executive summaries on the table in front of me. Uh, but I knew that the characters weren't ready to, for me to explore the themes that I explore in Savage Sun yet. I needed to introduce them to an audience and then develop them to a point where it made sense to explore the theme of the, really the dark side of man through the dynamic of hunter versus hunted. So uh, when I had all those on the table in front of me, it was very clear that the terminal list was the right way to introduce readers to James Reese, just because that theme of revenge without constraint is so primal, so visceral, so hard hitting. Uh, so I wanted to come out of the gate hard, come out super strong. And I thought that was the one that would be most likely to be recognized by somebody in New York by a publishing house. And so bam, all in on that. And then I knew, hey, for the second one, he's still not quite ready. To, for Savage Sun yet. I need to continue this journey, continue on this, uh, this uh, uh, with this theme of redemption, violent redemption, but really transition. And that, uh, that transition to find a new mission, a new purpose in life and learn to live again. And then when I finished that one up, I was like, okay, now's the time. It's time for Savage Sun. And it had a different working title actually for the, almost the whole time. Uh, but it was almost a little too too thoughtful. And I'm so glad that uh, Emily Bessler, Emily Bessler Books, who's imprint of Simon & Schuster for imprint of Atria Books, um, she, she liked it, but she was like, she thought it was a little too thoughtful. And then I came up with Savage Sun and uh, she loved it. So um, yeah, and it's the right one. It's definitely nice. the right title. Yeah. Dude, you are so calculated. <laughs> well, isn't everyone? I mean, you got to put thought into these things. <laughs> no, I love it. Most people didn't start in sixth grade thinking about oh, it. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, first, I'll spend a career in the military and then I'll. Yes. Do yeah, yeah. No, those are the two things that I wanted to do. Dude, and obviously, dude, the military when you, yeah. has to come first. Yeah. Well, listen, when you, when you set your mind to something, I mean, you're just, everyone should follow suit. I mean, mm -hmm. you, it's all in. 
I don't know any other way. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Well, you kind of answered my question that I had in my head, but I'm going to ask it in a slightly different method. Um, So you've been very clear that uh, the most dangerous game was, was the, uh, was really the bedrock of this particular book and you wanted to do it justice. And you had some thought there that you just mentioned about the first two books setting the stage for it. But do you think that your, your writing as a debut author, or maybe even uh, coming up with the follow-up um, with True Believer, do you think your writing was going to be good enough at that point to match what you had in your head in terms of, of really putting a stamp on, on Connell's story in, in your own? Well, I never really questioned that because uh, I don't know what else I could have done to prepare myself any better to explore these themes or to write in general um, than first being a fan of the genre and growing up with all the guys that, that you guys grew up with, uh, David Morrell and Nelson DeMille and AJ Cornell and JC Pollock and Tom Clancy and then later Stephen Hunter and then later Daniel Silva and Brad Thorne, Vince Lynn, uh, and even and today Mark Graney. Um, but having built that foundation so early in life and then also gravitated towards uh, Joseph Campbell and Here With A Thousand Faces and watching those interviews with Bill Moyers in the late 80s uh, and just seeing how these this uh, uh, the, the monolith and the, the hero's journey across cultures has been so similar. Um, so, so all that stuff really gave me the foundation. I don't know what else I, you know, could have done uh, <laughs> to prepare myself any better. And it was that yeah. part wasn't calculated though. That part was just me wanting to read, me loving to read, and escaping into the pages of these novels and reading about things that I thought I was going to do one day as a SEAL. So I thought I was preparing myself because there was there was no internet. You couldn't just type in U.S. Navy SEAL and go down the rabbit hole for <laughs> days and now years on end. <laughs> um, so there was no, almost nothing written and what was written I'm fairly confident I read all of it back in the early 80s all the way through I'd say up through the mid 90s I probably read everything you possibly could on SEAL so until the advent of the internet uh, I, I don't know how I could have been more prepared <laughs> um, but really it's because I was a fan first yeah. and I knew what I liked what I didn't like I saw and even if it, this wasn't calculated this was just me enjoying reading and then applying Joseph Campbell's uh, work to both film and to, uh, to what I was reading uh, in the fiction space uh, so all that stuff just came together at the right time and place so I don't think there was uh, anything I could have done um, uh, differently or to better prepare myself than to to read those masters back in the day right so let's go back to that time and place when you have the six ideas on the table and you're deciding and, and you've already explained why you went with one, two, three. But my question is this, are the remaining three ideas still lined up or has writing these first three novels taken James Reese on a different future path in your mind? The first three were, de- were definitely written down there and amongst those five, six, seven, eight. I need to go back and look exactly how many there were because uh, it may look like I'm organized from the outside looking yeah. in, but if I was to pan <laughs> this camera around the rest of the office, <laughs> you'd see that that's a bit of a facade. Uh, so I have things on legal document paper. I have little notes, sticky notes here and there, uh, stuffed in different drawers, then things I'm trying to find that are in boxes from the move. And then we have like, I've had like, I don't know, five different computers over the last few years, different hard drives that like, it's chaos. Like I, something I want to get better at is getting (laughs) much more organized at all these things. Um, So to answer your question, the fourth one was not on the table. So the one that I started researching in, that I outlined on the way to Russia, uh, doing the research for Savage Sun, getting some of that local flavor from Kamchatka Peninsula, just south of Siberia, to weave that into the the storyline. I left my computer at home. I left my phone at home. I brought a sat phone with me so I could keep in contact. But who knows what people have sent me over the years in emails and text messages, and I didn't want the Russians grabbing all that as soon as I walked through (laughs) customs. Uh, So I left all that stuff behind. So I outlined longhand uh, the story for the fourth novel uh, that I started then to research when I got back. Um, so that one was not one of the ones that was on the table. Huh. The fifth one will be, but the fourth one, there was a gap. And I saw, I looked at all those four, those six, seven, eight different ideas that I had down there initially. And there was one, there was a, there was a one book missing uh, from all those ideas that I had down. That's the fourth book. So there needs to, there needed to be something that happens between the third and uh, the fifth 
that uh, sets James Reese on his uh, on his next path that solidifies where he's going and what he's going to do uh, with what he thinks is the rest of his life. So, um, so that's the that's the fourth one. So that one was not written down early. Now we want to know. Teaser, teaser. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the fourth one, I'll, I'll give you a little teaser. The fourth one really explores the um, the legality, the ethics, and the morals uh, associated with targeted assassinations. So something Ooh. that the uh, it's more closely associated with the Israeli government since the inception of that country just after World War II, um, right. but has been obviously pursued by many countries across the world to include ours. Yeah. Um, so it explores that. But then what's, what's crazy is I started, there, there, there has to be a, you know, some other things going on. Obviously, it's not just an academic paper into, <laughs> into the, <laughs> the ethics of targeted assassinations. Um, but uh, so I started researching infectious diseases and I started researching bioweapons programs. I started oh, researching gosh. what the Japanese did pre-World War II and then during World War II to the Chinese, uh, what the Soviet Union did post-World War II, uh, what we did post-World yeah. War II up to until today. Um, so I was deep, deep into that world when COVID-19 hit, which made me uh, obviously very hypersensitive to that's what was going on because I've been talking to doctors involved with infectious diseases and with uh, doctors that are involved in taking those and weaponizing them um, and just really getting a, a good idea about what that world is like that didn't come from Hollywood, that didn't come from me watching, uh, you know, whatever outbreak or whatever that Dustin Hoffman yeah. movie was, um, and then thinking that that's real. And then I have to take all that knowledge uh, and then think it through from the enemy's perspective. And what have they been learning over the last almost 20 years at war watching us in Iraq and Afghanistan? And what are they learning now from COVID-19 and oh, our yeah. response to it as a country? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting place to be. Uh, and as soon as this book tour is over, I'm diving right back in to that world. Oh, it looks like you and I have been spending the same headspace uh, for oh, yeah. a couple months now. Oh, yes. Oh, nice. Nice. Yep. We'll have to compare notes. <laughs> that is a scary crazy. world. Mm. Oh, the research into it was, uh, it was amazing. I mean, the, the Soviet stuff and then our stuff. And, oh, yeah. Um, and then, of course, I'm fictionalizing it, and uh, which is fun to play around with and just think things through. Like, if I was the enemy, what would I be learning? How would I be adapting? What mm. would, more importantly, what do I want to do? Working back from my end state, uh, what do, how do I want to get there? Uh, right. So it's interesting to, to explore all that stuff. I'd love mm. to read your notes. I agree. <laughs> once again, they're totally disorganized. They're all over the place. I need to, <laughs> yeah, I need to get them in one spot. It's crazy. This was Outside just this Kyle. morning. <laughs> oh, nice. This was just this morning's Good job. Uh, research on that. So yeah. Nice Outside work. of Kyle Mills, I think everybody's notes are really messed up. <laughs> Gosh, well, he does. His outlines are just uh, um, incredible. A like a book. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's scary. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So my outlines uh, are I'm getting this one is pretty detailed for for book four because it's the the first one that I'm doing in um, uh, Scrivener. So I wrote the last book in Scrivener, but I didn't do the last outline in, uh, in Scrivener. Oh. Uh, so I wrote the whole book in there, but I didn't have an outline in there first. This is the first time I'm using it for the entire process. Uh, last time I think I said I used it for the entire process, but I was thinking just in terms of writing and chapters and dragging and dropping and all that stuff. But yeah. the actual outline now is in Scrivener too. Uh, and I'm still a beginner as far as uh, using Scrivener, I think, but uh, yeah, it's all in there. And I can, I can move around the outline without one lining and drawing arrows, you know, on, the, <laughs> on my legal documents, legal pads or my copying. stickies, they fell. Or, I'm, or so, I'm so old. Forgetting oh, which version I'm using in Word. And the, oh my gosh, look at that. I had a date on this one and it's, oh. so anyway. Yeah, I'm I don't so think old you're school. a beginner I have to in do anything. That. Nah, well, I don't believe that. <laughs> always, always learning, always adapting, always trying to do it better. Yeah. But so, so Jack, as with uh, the terminalist and with true believer, family really is a key theme uh, that goes on in the book. And we see that as well with Savage Son. So can you kind of maybe dive in and explore with us? Tell us about James' friendship with Rafe and um, really the, the Hastings family as a whole, because they kind of serve as a de facto family uh, for, for James in this book. Yeah, I think that. it's because I'm so I'm so close to it with uh, with my own family. So it's very natural to incorporate some of those themes, some of those feelings uh, into the pages of a, of a fictional thriller, kind of like it's natural for me to think back on Iraq and Afghanistan and training missions or whatever else, and then apply those feelings and emotions to a fictional narrative in that side of it. Well, same thing with family. It's just very natural for, for all of us to, as we're writing about family, to think of our own experience uh, and to incorporate that into the page. Ages in one way, shape, or form, of course, 
fictionalized. Um, so I think it's just a very natural thing for, for me to explore because I'm so close to it and it is so important to me. And it's um, the reason, the main reason that I left the military uh, because it was, well, it was clear that that, 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 that run was, uh, it, was time, it was time to move on and take care of my family. Um, so that, uh, I think that comes across in the writing. And then I think uh, where I got the Hastings name from is someone who actually is, was from, um, from Rhodesia that uh, then came to the United States, ended up in Montana. And I met her, gosh, when did I meet her before? Or gosh, I can't remember exactly, but I think it was summer of 2016. Um, so I hadn't yet submitted the book, hadn't finished, uh, hadn't started True Believer, hadn't finished the terminal list, but it was getting to the end, which is where Rafe Hastings first shows up. And I was like, ah, oh, Hastings, because that's the her last mm. name. And uh, so it just then, I guess, probably psychologically, it became like, oh, yeah, from future novels, it makes sense. Uh, okay, Rhodesia, Montana, uh, the hunting background. So all those things kind of get woven in that are a mix of uh, fact and fiction. Mm -hmm. Before you wrote True Believer, you were just talking about, you traveled to Africa, right? You conducted research for that novel. Uh, you, you did the same for Savage Sun. But yep. this time you braved the wilds of Siberia. What was it that drew you to that part of the world? And uh, yeah. what compelled you to set a portion of your third novel there? Yep. So it's uh, the, the we talked about most dangerous game being uh, uh, the really a huge influence on this novel and on me uh, from a very early age. But uh, there's three other novels that uh, are specifically, and there's a, a host of novels, but there are four in particular that influence this book. Um, and uh, the most dangerous game is really. The Foundation, uh, and then Rogue Mail is the other one by Jeffrey Household. And there's a uh, there's a specific term, and actually the editor Emily Bessler said circled it in her in her notes and was like, um, "What? I think this don't think this term works here." And then I had explained that uh, oh, this is uh, this is a tribute to Jeffrey Household in his uh, in his book Rogue Mail. Uh, oh, so yeah. I, I specifically left one word in there that isn't really used today because that that book is a little bit older. Uh, I think 1948, maybe. Anyway, wow. um, so it's it's not you know language changes and how people uh, yeah. you know people write changes a little bit and all that sort of thing. So, um, but I kept it in. So it's a tribute to to him that's left in there. And then First Blood is of course is a is an influence and. And then um, uh, Last of the Breed by Louis L'Amour. And so Siberia came from that, from Last of the Breed. So I still remember reading that in the summer of uh, probably 87, if uh, memory serves. So probably a year after the hardback came out, if it came out in a hardback first, which I think it did. Mm -hmm. um, but I read the paperback as soon as the paperback came out. So probably a year after it came out. So uh, summer of 87, maybe 88. But anyway, That's I have such great memories of, uh, of reading that book and just, there it is right there. Nice. Yep. 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 Present from, Christmas, from Mr. Yeah. Mike. Merry Christmas. Pre present from Mr. Cameron for Christmas. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> he did. Nice. That's right. <laughs> so I still have my original one. So the pages are yellow. And yeah. Right over there, otherwise I would grab it, but it's on the other side of the room because I just took photos of it because for my reading list, usually I do six books a, uh, a month on the reading list and I talk about how they impacted me at certain parts along my, my journey or whatever. But um, this time I'm doing four and it's those four novels, the four that really influenced Savage Sun. So there'll be four on the reading list in April. It'll be, it'll be those ones. But the Siberia portion uh, definitely came from just remembering what it was like to read Last of the Breed that summer when I was in uh, summer between junior high and high school, maybe or something like that. And yeah. uh, just what an experience that was and how cool that reading experience was for me. This, I still think it's the probably the best beginning and end to a, I don't think he calls it a prologue and an epilogue. Although that's what really it is. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I don't, I, 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 I'd, try, I'd be hard pressed to think of a better um, start and finish uh, to a novel, particularly to a like 12 year old kid that's uh, you know high to the cold war. And then he yeah. got down his stealth thing over Siberia and using his survival <laughs> skills to evade the route. Oh, sure. So, so we all did that. It's, it's, it's so Wolverines. great. Yeah. 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 Red Dawn, man. <laughs> all about yeah, exactly. well, hey, Red Dawn. Yeah, Red Dawn yeah, definitely came out. Inspired. Yep. It but, came out right around that same time. So yeah. uh, I don't want to give too much away about the end but um, and say exactly how it uh, it influenced because my guy is going a different direction. But yeah. uh, And there's a couple other things in there that they kind of pay tribute, like with the, the kayak and everything. So that's, uh, uh, that's awesome. Yeah, I love it. My yeah. favorite Chase novel, I think. Ah, oh, so great. Yeah. So great. So Eric, um, 
uh, brought up the Hastings family and Rafe in particular. So my question to you is, is there people or is there a person in your past, someone you're familiar with, who kind of is a little bit of Rafe? And, and do you, did you draw that out for your book character based on who you know as a person? Yeah, so when I was initially figuring out who the protagonist of these novels was going to be, um, uh, it, it made sense to kind of base his skill set on something, things that I had done, like enlisted SEAL sniper, uh, that sort of thing, and have him have <laughs> things that he wasn't so good at that I'm not so good at, like the surveillance side of the house or whatever, writing reports or like, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so I wanted to make him human. I just didn't want to make him someone that, uh, like, what my uh, I guess someone who hasn't been in special operations with their vision of a special operator would be yeah. kind of like what we really are, which is just like normal people. Um, and I wanted him to be a very likable character. Um, but I had this other character also who became Rafe that, uh, that I was contemplating in that same role. Um, cool. And I was like, uh, you know, looking at, at these different backgrounds, I was thinking about the second novel and more in particular, the third. Uh, and uh, it, it made sense for me to break those two apart and have two separate characters with just distinctive, very distinctly different personalities. Mm -hmm. um, so they weren't just like a shade different than one another, yeah. but they were completely different than one another um, as far as background experience, but that shared a lot of the same passions, uh, some of the same skill sets um, and uh, complemented each other very well. So they kind of kind of grew from there. Um, huh. but yeah, it wasn't like a, it wasn't like one person, uh, in my past, but there are people in this novel in particular that are based on singular individuals, uh, from my time in the military. Uh, and you probably, you probably know which ones those were. Uh, <laughs> we might know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mentioned some of their companies by name today that are in there. Yeah. I, you know, I morph their backgrounds a little, you know, a, a little bit to fit the storyline. Uh, I combine a couple people together, uh, into, into one, but, um, yeah, yeah. There, so those guys in there, I wanted to kind of say thank you to them yeah. uh, for both what they did for the country and for being a part of my experience in themes, uh, and then also for serving as inspirations uh, to be, as an inspiration to people that are getting out, not just of the military, but making any transition in life. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to get that in there to kind of show some of the struggles people deal with, even if it's just in a paragraph with a little bit of a background. Um, but really this time show that, Hey, these, they, we come from all different backs of life, uh, facts, uh, all different backgrounds. Um, and that's what makes us so strong uh, as a unit is everyone's bringing that different experience to the table in special operations. And, uh, and it makes us uh, stronger as a team, no doubt about it. Hmm. So digging into something a little bit weapons, they're more than just a tool for a Navy SEAL. In many ways, they become kind of part of your persona, at least from an outsider's <laughs> perspective. It looks those that are watching. <laughs> like, what do you mean? Well, that's my question. Funny, so funny you hold um, that up. Yeah, yeah. Pick, pick up, pick up the Winkler because that, that that applies to this question. Um, so tell us. So I even reached out to you at one point when I read a particular chapter, which we're not going to give away. But tell us about James and his Winkler and how that came about and, and, and how that, how that fits his personality really. Yeah. So back in gosh, probably sixth, seventh, eighth grade, I had uh, Rogers Rangers rules, uh, on my wall of my wow. room, uh, and probably yeah, talking about tomahawks in there. And then you're thinking about the French and Indian war and uh, you're reading about the things that these guys did and just what a, uh, I don't know how closely associated that is really with the, the frontier. And what I was interested in, even at that age, um, were the people that adapted and took on some of the, uh, some of the customs that learned from what, Native Americans, First Nation, uh, when they got here and incorporated mm -hmm. that into their being to make them better warriors, them better hunters, um, and just more self-reliant and, uh, you know, self-sufficient on the frontier. So I've always been a big Tomahawk fan and, uh, I've had, I always had axes, always had Tomahawks. When I got to the SEAL teams, I forget, I think it was Cold Steel that was making uh, a couple different versions back then. And they had a, uh, they had like one with a, a you know, a wooden shaft 
Captain I enjoy. I got that one. That was a tribute to Rogers Rangers. And then they had a more modern one. Uh, and so I had those and I was throwing them at trees and, you know, whatever else trying to get, get the throw down. Um, and so it's just always been something that's interested me. And then they, when we got into Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, people started to use them um and use them quite effectively uh for a, in a couple different ways um so so yeah i was uh, gonna ask if you, you snuck yeah. if you were able to sneak those in country so yeah i mean there's no sneak i mean it's just part of the <laughs> part of your yeah. Loadout, yeah. Gear. <laughs> uh, so i yeah and, and i didn't I'll, I'll say this i don't want to get the impression that i actually like snuck through and did some of the no, things I that know, james I reese know. does in mexico <laughs> uh, so I, not saying that others have not um but you know i i didn't but um but i've just always been attracted and uh and fascinated by the tomahawk as a as a tool and uh so it, it was very natural from the beginning when I was thinking of like a, a logo for, you know, this the Jack Carr brand or whatever else. Like I just looked looked really at my desk and I put two tomahawks on the floor. I crossed them and I took a picture and I sent it to, to Emily Bessler and I was like, "Hey, what do you think of this?" And uh, and she loved it. Brilliant. So, yeah. so, <laughs> so then I called Daniel at uh, Daniel at Winkler and uh, I was like, "Hey, man, do you mind if I use these?" And he's like, "Oh, man, absolutely." And he's been a great friend for years and is just an amazing guy. He did the tomahawks for uh, and all the blades for Last of the Mohicans. That oh movie. yeah. I was just uh, thinking about that when you were talking about, yeah. Yep. And he's just an amazing guy. So uh, as soon as all this passes, like we've been meaning to do it for years, but I'm going to go out there and we're going to make, now he has a factory and everything because he's he's gotten to that stage where he has a bunch of different people working and different, different projects. Uh, But he still has this little shack and it's so cool. It's right outside his house. And we sit up there and we drink, drink whiskey, drink Sinatra select on the, uh, on the deck there. (laughs) And we overlook it. It's beautiful in North Carolina. And, uh, and we're going to go out to that shed and he still has his original stuff, like where he made the last of the Mohicans type stuff and the anvil and the whole thing. And I've always wanted to, wanted to do that. So we're going to go out and do that and hopefully get some good footage of it too. Cause, uh, cause why not? And uh, I'm going to make a, make a blade and pound that out in there. And I've always wanted to, do that so uh get my rambo on in there last That'd of the mohicans fun. man one of my favorite yeah. movies of all so time. My i need to watch it again Love i haven't it. seen it for so long i oh, need to watch it again yeah. it is an amazing yeah i mean you know they, it's, a fun, it's an amazing they filmed movie. some of it about 30 yeah, minutes feel, most of it oh, nice. so most of it nice. by where you live yeah yeah nice yeah it's awesome it's so yeah that's where the tomahawk came from it's uh and daniel's been such a good friend for years and that's kind of his thing is that, yeah. uh, is that I'm, I'm guessing i'm guessing daniel got a, a jack car bump on sales that's just my guess because yeah. the moment i i read about the winkler tomahawk i looked up uh, how much it would cost and i saw it in your buying guide and i thought when i can justify that to my wife and my <laughs> Business expense. I don't want as well. Yeah, right. Research. For sure, business expense. Research. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, he's a, he's amazing, and he's done so much for uh, for special operations, just behind the scene. Uh, him and his wife Karen, uh, just great, great people. So um, yeah, such such a good guy. So uh, it was only not, and he did say that. He said, especially now, this last shot show. He said there were so many people coming by his booth in Vegas, and for those listening, shot shows an industry show where they uh, kind of bring out new new weapons and gear and that sort of thing for law enforcement military it used to be really focused on hunting and outdoors but after the yeah. left it fully shifted to you know right. tactical the gi joe stuff yeah. and uh and so yeah he said so many people came by the booth uh saying that they heard about the tomahawks and his knives in my novels so <laughs> So that makes me cool. happy. Awesome. So yeah. Makes you yeah. Happy, I'm sure. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cause I want to give back, not just, you know, not just take and you know, I'll say thank you, uh, but hopefully drive <laughs> some, some business his way. So that makes me feel like it's a, it's a win-win, but he was so cool. He's just like, yeah, absolutely use those tomahawks. And, uh, but I want to make sure that, you know, he was on board with it, obviously not just make, <laughs> us, not just make assumptions. Uh, so, yeah. so very cool. It's such a nice guy. We hard pressed to find a nicer person. Hmm. Jack, one of the themes that all three of your novels examines is that line that those who spend their time downrange um, straddle between the necessary brutality um, that, that's part of the, I mean, it's the tip of the spear is meant to kill, you know, um, and not crossing the lines that many of our enemies uh, are perfectly willing to cross. Mm-hmm. I know in the heat of the battle, you don't have the time to such, for such considerations, but in the quiet space you do. Is your writing a way of working through those difficult questions or is it more a way of you expressing the answers you already have? Yeah, probably the latter um, and exploring those questions uh, a bit. And what's important in what you just said is that you can't be thinking about those things in the middle 
of it downrange. You have to think about those things before you go downrange. And as a leader, you have to communicate it to your guys, not just once in one little brief or some people's heads might be other places or whatever else. Maybe someone's not there. Maybe they're dental. Um, but you have to <laughs> continually bring it up uh, as you talk uh, throughout the training process. Um, so it's not something that they've been in talk, they've been thought about once and then just moved on. Like, okay, I, okay, what did he just say? Something about morality and ethics. And never mind, I got to get my gear ready for this next trip. No, you have to work it into the training. Uh, you have to talk about it. You have to revisit it. And uh, the guys have to know how important it is that we as a country and therefore us as a unit, and if you take it down to a smaller level as a team and an individual on that team, uh, that uh, we have to maintain that moral high ground because sometimes that's all that differentiates us from the enemy. And I strongly believe that. So, uh, cause there's, there's, I mean, there's not too much of a difference between dropping a bomb on something that uh, has a ton of collateral damage and somebody walking in, especially to a military target with an S vest on. Um, so there's some def there's some questions there and you need to think about those ahead of time and you have to make your decision on what side of that you were on. And for me as a leader, it's very important for, it was very important for me to talk to my guys about that and let them know how I felt about it and what we were going to do downrange because it takes that off their plate and allows them to focus on what they need to focus on uh, so that they're not in a situation where they're questioning, oh, what should I do here? What's the right thing to do here? They know already mm -hmm. that we are maintaining that moral high ground because we need to differentiate ourselves from the enemy. We are different mm -hmm. than the yes. enemy. Um, and of course, we'll slip up now and again. That's just, you know, hey, that's just life. And the enemy will use those things as a, as a recruitment tool and, and all the rest. Uh, but it's important for us to maintain that moral high ground and to have that. Uh, so that's naturally going to find its way to my novels. Um, it could not. Right. No. Jack, all four of us loved Savage Sun. Oh. And we can guarantee without a shadow of a doubt that anybody else who picks it up will love Savage Sun. Thank you. Absolutely. With that being said... What about what's going to happen next with Jack Reese? Can you give us a little bit of insight for the lucky few of us who've already read the exploits inside <laughs> Savage Sun? Yes. What's coming next? Yes. So uh, if you get to the end, um, I don't know how much to, to give away in these. Yeah. I don't give away at all because I love talking about it. And yeah. love about it. I'm still <laughs> writing book four, so I'm still exploring right. exactly how far it goes and, and all that. So, so uh, I'm kind of in the middle of that right now. Um, but where's, uh, where's the setting? Where, where you say, or is that so, too much? Nope. Nope. This one is uh, more U S based, yeah. uh, which is helpful, especially now that it's hard to travel. Can't travel so, go anywhere. <laughs> right. So for the, so for the first one, I didn't need to travel anywhere. I'd been to all the mm -hmm. places that essentially that I wrote about. I'd been to, uh, I could think back to Iraq. I could think back to Afghanistan. I lived in San Diego yeah, uh, at a time on Fisher's Island where the first one finishes up. Um, uh, so I had those places in mind. Um, so I didn't need to like, go there anymore. Uh, second one, I needed to go to Mozambique. I needed to put, put boots on the ground and I needed to then go to South Africa and talk to those people down there that, uh, that were now part of these anti-poaching units and find out what their backgrounds were because it's fascinating. Um, so I needed to, to, to get that. For the third one, I had to go to Russia. There was no... <laughs> Crazy. There's no way I was getting You're a crazy bastard. Yeah, there was, there was, that's what my wife said. She was not happy because I had some other trips planned that were planned like two years in advance. That were like on either side. Oh, right. oh man, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta go to Russia. I, I Navy, <laughs> Navy SEAL, Sorry, top go. secret clearance. I'm going to Russia. Yeah, I, that's why I left everything behind. That's why I left the electronic behind. But, uh, mm. but yeah, I had to had to do it. So for this fourth one, it very naturally wasn't by design that I didn't have to go anywhere to do research. Um, it's just how the story moved forward. Um, there's a couple of places I'd like to go, but I but I can't. Uh, yeah like the farm for CIA training type stuff. I think yeah. You know, research. But most everything that I'm doing for book four is research based mm -hmm. uh, and all the places that, uh, that I visit in the novel or have characters visit in the novel or places that I've, that I've already been like just last night, I was working through a, a scene that could take place in a few different areas where some information is exchanged. And I was like, ah, oh, is it Macau? Is it, uh, you know, is it like Hong Kong? Is it, uh, it might be the Philippines because I have a lot of experience down there. Um, I can do the sights, the smells, the tastes. I don't need to do too much research and then have to wonder like, ah, uh, 
you know, the things I researched, you know, who were those written by? What's their background? Did that person actually visit there and spend time? Like yeah. I can be like, okay, I've spent time here. I've studied this place. Um, I can incorporate the sights, sounds and the smells and, and incorporate that local flavor into this. So I think that's where it's going to end up. Um, but point being, uh, but the fourth one, I don't need to go uh, to too many places because I've been to them already. Uh, so that's going to be a, big, a good question for book five is, uh, is where I'm going to go for that one. So <laughs> Antarctica. That, Antarctica. Think, exactly. I'll, I'll find someplace. I think I'm going to need to go someplace Social for, distance. For book five. So, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll see how things go. You know, who knows? Maybe the moon. They'll all be, they'll all be Google-based. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Brother, you, you know what's coming next. Here we go. Um, we have uh, finished our uh, formal questioning of Savage Sun, which comes out tomorrow. Go out and buy it. Amazing. Yes. But now you must enter into the lightning round oh, where we're going to ask you a whole bunch of questions. I know. Sean that, asked me uh, a, some of us a have not, put a thought not very into. very nice one that first time. I'll never forget. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's drinking now, boys. Check this it is, out. This is the buds of the yeah, horror it. world. It's called taking, preparing. I don't know why you guys call it. You seem to, everybody has like to take you another drinking, sip. drinking, you say it like, like negative. Uh, yeah, <laughs> preparation. Yeah, we're, I know you just took a sip, but everyone else, we're, let's take another sip before we get into this. Another one. I don't oh, mind that. Mm-hmm. Dude, here we go. The Italian mob squares off against the Russian mafia, which makes an appearance in Savage Sun. Going gangs of New York style. Who wins? The Italians or the Russians? I answered this question in the acknowledgments. So I think it's like in the third paragraph, maybe fourth in the acknowledgments. And I got to be careful about how much I say, because then all of a sudden you got guys showing up at the house or something. You know? <laughs> right? Got, guys that kind of look like me. I don't know about maybe. it. It could be a tie. Uh, <laughs> not a tie. Not a tie. No. no. Yeah, not a tie. But yeah, not a tie. So you see like paragraph three or four in the acknowledgments. Uh, <laughs> it's a good teaser. There it is, folks. <laughs> Crack the book open. Now you got to buy the book to get the answer. Now. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, and and so I always I know what goes through my mind when I'm uh, I ask this question. I know what goes through my mind, but I want to know what goes through Jack Carr's mind when he sees people walking down the street with earpods in their ears. I'm still annoyed by it. <laughs> I just uh, you know some of those people that did it early on, like the early early adapters, uh, that put the Bluetooth <laughs> thing in, right. or just walking around talking to themselves. Oh, it just. Yes, like so your situational awareness goes right out that window. Yeah, you're uh, pretty much in condition white, um, which for those <laughs> listening means that uh, you have no uh, awareness. Uh, usually, condition yellow is where you want to be, and you want to be just kind of aware of your surroundings, not paranoid, mm-hmm. but you know, kind of looking around and aware so that you don't get hit by a bus <laughs> or something, you know, or shot <laughs> by somebody. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right. Like, so basics, like you want to cover those basics, and but then also you want to be aware of what's going on in case you need to take some evasive action. So it's not like going from shadow to shadow shadow like to like ninja mode you know like you're not doing a a michael dudikoff you know uh you uh, you know from tree to tree uh it's just being aware aware of your surroundings i do want to get i want to walk behind somebody and just like flick their ear and watch them like spit out so i don't do it so i don't do uh, do that ear pods i had to do something for an interview recently and luckily i had these uh, close by so i had to plug in yeah but they're not the ear earbuds. Uh, no, no. This All is right. how I and ignore my family. Design. And the new ones, like not just the old ones that went around your ear. When no, you yeah. Like walk around to show everyone how self-important you are. Mm-hmm. But the newer ones that are designed like to go in to work with that Apple devices, like they're specifically designed so that teenage kids will lose them and the parents have to buy another one oh, uh, to replace. Like, yeah, they're they're over a hundred bucks a pop. That's it. I know. Yeah. By design. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. by design. Damn you, Apple. Damn you. But I do love you. <laughs> I no. own stock, yes. I do love you. So, um, uh, my final question is if you could be a member of any 80s TV sitcom family, because we all, all, we all love the 80s television, which would it be? Ah, you guys already know. Ah, but, for the, but for those listening, uh, for sure, Magnum. Uh, easy. There it is. There yeah, it is. Easy. All right. Well, it is a tough question. I mean, there are so many great families you could like if you had to be a part of the a-team or you right. had to you had to ride shotgun with simon and simon you know like whatever in the dodge you know power wagon like you know yeah. those are all good options yeah, there, there are no bad options in the age well uh, uh sean would be a member of the uh, growing pains <laughs> perfect <laughs> 
because facts of life. Hurt. I'd like to be because adopted by hurt. the facts of life family. Yeah. Thank you. No, I was going to say, uh, er, er, Chris, I was really surprised by your Golden Girls answer when we asked you that. <laughs> Dude, those girls are spunky and you love them. Yeah. I know you do. <laughs> They're still on today. It's like oh, Betty White yeah. will outlive us all. Yeah. So now that we've gone down that hole. David, yeah. David the other day had a hard castle McCormick reference, which was the I first. I loved it. I had just I made it. the day before, oh. and I was like, what? I saw that. So I've, I've recorded a bunch of, uh, cause my, for my movie Mondays and things like that, I tried to like, I had tried to add some structure after the first year on social media. I was like, okay, I need to add some structure to this because I'm just running around every morning like a crazy person. Uh, so I want to add some structure. So I'm like, okay, movie Mondays. Yes. So a lot of the times I incorporate films that I liked and usually they're eighties. And I think there's, there's not copyright stuff or something because I put one on from like 2005 or something and immediately like within seconds they the sensors had grabbed it off but like the 80s ones really? yeah but the 80s ones they they leave up so yeah. um yeah so <laughs> not important 80s weren't important gen x nobody cares yes no so way. uh so yeah so I put those up on so anyway point being I have a Hardcastle and McCormick intro uh recorded ready for some point over the next year or two Jeez, uh, that's a great there. opening theme song yeah, I know no it was so great the coyote no people rem- that should be a good good uh yeah remember the coyote like yeah who remembers that a few people on social media yeah. I'm old enough yeah yeah we do <laughs> all right Mike? me um do it do it all right When you witness that first door ding on the Land Cruiser in a shopping parking lot, are we going to see that death scene in your next novel? (laughs) I'm struggling with this because I don't really know what to do on that front. Uh, I mean, the point of having one of these things is you can ding it up and, you know, whatever, and you're fine. uh, with this version, with this res- restoration, I don't know. It's a tough one. So it hasn't arrived yet because it's quarantined along with the rest of the country. Uh, <laughs> and it's in Southern California still. It should have been here by now. But um, yeah, it's an 88 Land Cruiser. It's uh, a character, kind of like the TV shows we just talked about. They had cars or helicopters that were characters in those shows. And so I guess it was very natural for me to incorporate a vehicle as almost a character in uh, in mine. And also to help develop characters. So I use you know, weapons, guns, knives, whatever, uh, vehicles, uh, different things like that as tools to develop characters because when you see someone driving a Land Cruiser, it tells you something about them. It's mm-hmm. different than the person that is driving uh, like the Mercedes G Wagon and you immediately you make inferences. Just like when I see somebody uh, at the range and they're carrying uh, a weapon in a certain way uh, or it's a certain type of weapon, like I, I know certain things about them right away without even yeah. talking about them. Um, so I use those in the novel as well to develop characters. Um, mm-hmm. So it was very natural for me to put the, a vehicle in the first novel that uh, happened to be in our driveway at the time, uh, <laughs> broken down and not working anymore, unfortunately. Um, and uh, then to, then to bring that vehicle back in the third novel, just kind of how I kind of like how it's coming back to me in real life uh, with the same restoration. So um, yeah, so, so we shall see. So I'm not sure what I will do uh, if that thing gets, <laughs> when, it, when it gets a ding or if it's how much use it's going to get. I almost want to just get another one. Uh, yeah, right. yeah, the backup. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I've been looking at. I've already been he, looking at. Them. You need some deniability here. Much to my wife's chagrin. Yeah. Exactly. Oh. Plead the fifth. <laughs> oh man! All right. Uh, some guys in the teams would get nicknames, I'm sure, or earn nicknames, or be uh, bestowed a nickname. What was the worst nickname that you? <laughs> that you heard of any of the guys in the teams back in your oh, day? Oh, man. That is a great question. Um, I know there are, must have been some horrible ones. Um, and I'm, It's and cable. I, you can do whatever. You can say whatever. Ah, oh, geez. You know, we're left to... Let's, gosh, ask me that next time because I don't want to mess this one up. There's, I know there's some really bad ones, but for some reason I like... Anything that was like really horrible, I just kind of like don't... I don't know. It's not at the forefront of my mind because I think about good, positive, fun things. Um, <laughs> and then yeah. you come on here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. And then I come on here and you ask me the tough Sorry, questions. Gosh, <laughs> man, you guys are like Oprah's, a bunch of Oprah's, you know, asking those tough questions. Um, <laughs> for Mike, for Mike Wallace. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Boy, I had um, money. Yeah, no, we're going to come back to that one because uh, <laughs> most of them end up being fun type nicknames. And uh, if you don't, take them on board uh, as such your life is miserable like, <laughs> you, you have cannot, to accept it right and then you try to pick your own 
that's no, the worst. That not doesn't work at all. Yeah, you know, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So they, <laughs> yeah, you try to pick your own. Oh my gosh, it's like blood in the water, <laughs> especially if you're like a new guy. Like you're yeah. only getting a nickname as a new guy. Like you show up at the team, you do something stupid, you get your nickname. That's yeah. kind of how it goes. Unless you have a last name that's like just kind of naturally has its own. Like people will call you that, and then yeah. and you're kind of safe. It's like, ooh, yes, like you're safe. <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, so I was kind of, so I was kind of safe. So I fell into that category. Like I was good. Um, but other people, yeah, they did something dumb like that first week, that first month, that first year, uh, that first 18 months at the Jeez. SEAL team. Yeah. And that stuck with you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you, want to be Magnum? I, you say you want to be Magnum and make Mickey Higgins? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> exactly. Or something much worse. Like, I'm, I'm Black Mamba. No, you're not. No, you're yeah. not. <laughs> and just the fact that you tried to do it then puts you in a separate category from everybody else. Oh you're yeah. like, oh, that's one of the guys that yeah. tried to choose that, his own nickname. Yeah. Like, yeah, not, not, yeah now you're yeah, beef tits. Now uh -huh. you're beef tits. And then you're like, what? You really went through buzz with that guy. You're like, well, I've never seen that guy before in my life. Like, I don't we know. just fast forward five uh, years. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, you're gonna get it. Whatever nickname, it just kind of comes naturally, and you're gonna get it. And then you right. better you better embrace it, because uh, if you don't, then everyone else is gonna embrace it even more so for you. Uh, which is camaraderie. How it's a great which thing. Is how it should yeah. Be. yeah. Although now you can probably sue or something. Right? Now it's probably. <laughs> Go in your safe space. <laughs> Talk possible. to your commanding officer. It's possible. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they nicknamed me this. It's possible. It's possible. I don't know. I'm Jeez. out now. I don't know. All right, Eric, you're up, buddy. Uh, All right. I'm up, and, and Oprah definitely doesn't ask questions like our lightning round, that's for sure, because here's one for you. So you have two choices. It's like Sorry. a lightning storm round. Like, yeah. It's not yeah. Really yeah. Flash. We throw it's pellets. Like, <laughs> like, uh, first <laughs> question is, you get to – two choices here. You get to either shave your beard or your head. Nope. Nope, neither. <laughs> neither. It wasn't a neither. I didn't hear the end of the question. What was it? But no. Beard or head? <laughs> yeah, not not the beard. Yeah. So so so, the, so it's the it's the head so for the sure. Head. Yeah. Okay. That's not oh. a question. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Just double checking. <laughs> okay. My second question. We know how you like your coffee. We of course had the car coffee challenge. So bad news is we have a severe honey shortage. And so I know you're going to put some half and half in that coffee. Oh yeah. But if you can't have honey. Are you going to do A, stevia, B, agave, or just forget that crap and you'll just have it with the half and half? You know, we don't have agave in the house, so I just do the, do the half and a half. But I kind of like, I wean myself a little bit. So the first cup for sure is honey and cream in the morning. Second one, yep, still honey and cream. Third one, like if I'm, it, I'll be like, oh, you know, kids are screaming, whatever else. Like one of those things is not going to happen. Or I'm looking in the fridge and we're out all of a sudden of, of cream. Well, then it's a little honey goes in. Or if they're both still there and for whatever reason, like it's just more convenient to grab the cream, then that goes in. Uh, and then by the end, like I might just have black coffee that gets very cold and I just keep sipping throughout oh, the day. My gosh, uh, we have the so same kind life. Of, it kind of, <laughs> so it kind of works it down. So everyone is not a specifically is not exactly the way I would like it when I get out of bed in the morning. Um, just because things start happening so fast yeah. and it's a full on sprint from the second I wake up to the second I go to bed. Um, but, uh, that first cup of coffee for sure is, is honey is cream is stirred in. Yeah, and, and the car coffee challenge, I, people, we're doing it a bit wrong. Like yeah. I feel bad that they just put like the honey and they didn't stir it. And they no. like, they, do they shoot it? Like who does that? I don't know. It's, it doesn't seem like a very enjoy natural it. thing to do, but, no, uh, but I'm very it. thankful um, that everyone is doing that. I'm very, yeah. I'm very appreciative. Very cool. But if you're listening to this, you might want to stir it a little bit. <laughs> Dude, I saw, them. I think Chris Miller, bottle. Chris Miller, actually, I think he, he didn't even put the coffee, grind it or, Nothing. I think he just took coffee in his yeah. mouth and honey at the end. Yeah, that's not the right way. Ooh, no, yeah. no, definitely not. No, no. it's hazardous. <laughs> Still picking well, coffee grinds out of his beard. Good job, Chris. Yeah, yeah. Mine didn't no. taste like honey at all. I don't know what. <laughs> I use bourbon because I, I don't liked drink it. coffee. I liked Perfect. It. That's even better. More productive that way. <laughs> yeah. John, you're up. All right. You don't have to give us all the the gory detail or the specific details, but give us the Cliff Notes version of how you dress an elk. <laughs> Well, the first, I'll give you my first experience. My first experience was treating it as a very large deer, which is not the way to go about um, <laughs> field dressing your first elk that you get at last light uh, in the mountains of New Mexico. Um, but I was with a friend, 
and uh, it was a muzzle loader shot. Uh, so muzzle fairly, loader. Fairly close, oh, yeah, gosh. and it ended up being a huge elk um, and a public land. Um, and we walked up on this thing and I still have a problem with walking up on something like it's not a person, uh, cause it was living, it was breathing. And I still walk up the way I would a human, which means that they can't see you. So you just get to that just, just, just outside of their like frame of view. And then you walk up and you're ready to, to, uh, engage again. Um, and I still do that with animals and it's more, I think it's more of a respect thing than anything else. Um, and, but still some of these animals can get up and gore you. So, uh, you better make sure that it's dead. Um, so I approach it in the same way. So I did that and came in, sun is going down and it was just, I was so taken aback by how big that thing was. Um, cause it was my first one that, uh, I mean, I was like, wow, this is like 10 deer, essentially. Um, <laughs> and then, it's like a horse. It's yeah. like a horse. The horse. Yeah. yeah, dude. So, so I treated it like I, like I did, uh, like I would a deer, uh, which took a long time uh, to do. Because the friend that was with me had not uh, taken an elk yet either. So we were both treating it like it was a deer. Um, and it took forever, I think, to like, maybe four in the morning or something like that. So really we just got it off the ground, uh, got some, um, uh, got some branches underneath it, got some air underneath it, that sort of thing. Uh, made it back to our camp, which was a couple miles away. And then, uh, the next morning got up, came back and then brought it back to the uh, trailhead a couple of miles away where uh, we could then bring in the horses and, and, uh, and get it out of there. But, uh, I guess that was a very long, non-lightning around way <laughs> of answering. Um, but there are other people that can do it so fast, and they do it not the way you typically would do a deer. And they go and they get the back straps out first, like along the back. It's incredible um, what guys can do that really know what they're doing, uh, yeah. whose whose lives are about guiding, outfitting, all that sort of thing. Like it's incredible. Like to see those guys go to work, like they really know what they're doing. Um, I'm just kind of like survival for me. Like I can, I can, I can do it. Uh, I've done it. Uh, but it's, it's for me, I love doing it with people that know what they're doing so I can learn a little bit more, get yeah. a little bit more effective, more yeah. efficient. Um, and, and we took everything off that thing. Like, you know, that neck meat, like, like you're just getting every little bit off that. And, um, uh, so yeah, it's. That'll last you a while, like, right? Well, it hundreds did. of pounds. Yeah. yeah, it's a couple hundred pounds of uh, of meat for sure. Uh, now moose is even bigger. So moose, Scary. And I was, actually, it's what I'm going to post today because I posted something earlier and I had to take it down real quick because something wasn't quite right. So uh, there's another thing that I was going to post just before we got on, and I was actually um, the third novel, uh, not the quote that starts the novel, but the one that starts part one comes from this book right here meditations on hunting uh and i was incorporating that into the post so after we get off here i'll i'll do that and i'm actually talking about uh my experience with a moose and just how crazy it was to to walk up on that thing and how much meat came off that and i even gave a third of it to the outfitter a third of it to the processor up in alaska and i took a third of it and it still lasted over a year so it's Dude. uh it's amazing and then today, those things are scary oh i mean it's so very huge. big scary crazy big crazy um but hopefully today like what we're in the midst of you know in midst of corona, uh, coronavirus and COVID 19 and when i talk to people about it i i say hey you know, take some notes take some notes on um what you felt good about as far as your preparedness your level of preparedness for your, yourself and your family uh your community your neighbors and then when this is over or when you get the opportunity more importantly take action on those notes uh, so that if something does happen in the future, you can allocate the, the, uh, your bandwidth where it needs to go rather than towards water, towards food, towards shelter, towards that base kind of the pyramid. Yeah. Uh, you can allocate it on solving the problems or adapting to the current environment that is changing. Um, so I think that's, that's important. So people can learn a lot um, as individuals, as families, uh, as neighbors, as communities. And then at the strategic level, obviously as a country, we're learning, we're learning huge lessons mm -hmm. right now. Um, but bringing it back to the moose, for people that might have had a problem with with hunting uh, or with meat, uh, eating meat, um, especially locally sourced, although my moose was not local, it was in Alaska, obviously. Um, so I did travel for that, but there are things that you can do locally, like for, for here, my, the elk that we're eating now, uh, that was a local elk that's here from Utah. Um, that's essentially, essentially in our backyard, 30 minutes away, 45 minutes down the road. Um, and uh, and it was amazing. It's gonna push, 
feed us for over a year. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely incredible. So maybe people could take a breath and think about really what self-reliance means and if it's important to them, maybe it's not. Maybe they still want to rely on government to do everything for them to include mm -hmm. if something, someone wants to take what you have, like calling 911 in the middle of the night and maybe someone's going to answer in the middle of a national emergency and maybe someone's not. Maybe someone's going to be there in two minutes. Maybe they're going to be there in 30 minutes or maybe they're not coming at all. Uh, so just thinking about self-reliance and self-sufficiency and what, and what what you're comfortable with really as an individual and as a family. Um, and then setting that up in the future so that you can allocate bandwidth really where it needs to go. Right. Yeah, have the basics already covered. Yeah. And that might be the most uh, intelligent answer we've ever had during a uh, <laughs> without a doubt. Well, by that point, people are like into you know their second couple of fingers. I have another drink. Um, my, my last question, your last question, is a yes no question. So it's oh jeez, oh it's easy. So pretty soon, God willing, and I think you'll have some good news. Hopefully, we're hoping um, the terminal list will start production, and what we want to know is, will you try to use your sway? <laughs> to enable the crew to conduct an on-site interview of Jack Carr as he watches the terminal list be made. Oh, as I watch? Yeah. What? As I watch, well, yeah, that's like, an easy no, we're one. We're saying, will you use your sway to let us interview you on set? Yeah, that's, that's an easy one. Yes, I thought it was gonna be more difficult. I thought you were gonna ask for a cameo or something. No, no, no. <laughs> I'll put this ask, ask for a cameo. Oh, ask See, for they'd a cameo. have to pay me because I'm sag. <laughs> they'd have to pay me because I'm sag, so I wouldn't ask for that. Uh, ben, I think that that is something that's not outside the realm of possibility. Nice. So we We're so like, excited right for it. We really, I mean, for for us too, as as fans. Yeah, yeah fans, so definitely as fans. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I'll tell you, and uh, and Sean, you know how this works from your your background, but uh, you know, it was my first experience um, helping on a script, and uh, I could not be happier on where this thing is like it is awesome so good and it's just the pilot episode but um oh my gosh i can't i really can't think of how it could possibly be better like it is they knocked it out of the park and then i got to uh you know get to help out and and anyway it was so cool to be able to have a to, to have them listen to me and then incorporate um my suggestions my recommendations uh almost all of them and uh, just to see that process see it evolve from uh, the first kind of rough draft that I saw into where it is now, um, oh, it's incredible. And it's, that is I could a not unicorn, be better. as you know. Yes. <laughs> Most people don't like it. Yeah. I mean, I've, obviously, I've been studying this for a long time since I was a little kid. And, you know, usually authors are kind of like, ah, you, and that's why they like to get rid of the authors uh, early yeah. on because they're, oh, you ruined my vision, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. Uh, so for me, it was very important. And that's what they thought too, everybody except for Chris. Um, you know, we're just kind of worried. They're like, why does Chris want this guy involved? We like to get rid of the authors like right away. <laughs> yeah. Um, and he was like, you're no. not a typical author though, though. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, come oh, on. Yeah, but, but on, honestly, Chris, it, it's rare. I mean, you have, you got Tom Clancy, you got currently, you got Michael Conley who, who has sway over his project, mm -hmm. but most of the authors, authors we've talked to are studs and they don't have that kind of sway generally. No. It's, it's rare. And this is awesome. This it's the best sign for a project when the author is still involved. It really um, is. Yeah, so, because that's the so best happy. product. Yeah. So happy. I mean, I think sometimes I, get, I can see how it happened. And I was very, you know, aware of how different First Blood is from the movie. Um, yeah. And I love yeah. both. Uh, right. I think they're both amazing, different projects. Um, and so I, I, I made it very clear to the, the people that I had to, had to talk to um, <laughs> when, I, when I started down the path that, hey, I can for sure put these in two separate categories. Um, the one is telling a story visually, you know, one is obviously on the written page and I can look at them as two separate projects. And uh, Chris was never worried about it, but he's just like, you know, you gotta talk to these guys. So, uh, so I did and, and, uh, and it was great. And then they were like, wow, thank you. Like they, they see the, see the value, um, not just because I'm so intimately involved with uh, obviously the characters and the storyline. And, uh, and for me, obviously it's great if it does, does well. Um, but uh, from being able to tap into that background, you know, and be like, uh, no, we don't really would never do that. No one would ever say something like yeah. that. Like, anybody military watching this is going to like laugh at that. And they're like, okay. Cause they want to keep it up. Chris wants it authentic. He wants it gritty. Um, he wants the themes to be in line with the story. Um, although visually, obviously you have to change certain things here and there. And I love bit. the changes that they've made. They've really turned it from a political thriller into a psychological thriller, which mm. is oh, good. a great way to go. And I yeah, could yeah. not be happier.
Are you going to do the Stan Lee thing where you're like going to show up in a scene and eat the movies? Every, everyone. So I haven't asked that yet. Um, but, uh, so, do it. but I will, do it. I will, I will definitely ask. Um, but like for Stephen Hunter, he was in um, uh, Point of Impact and if, or sorry, in Shooter. Uh, obviously yeah. adapted from right. Impact, but it got cut in the editing room. So his, uh, his, well, scene I didn't know that got That's cut. Didn't so know. he was a, he was a gun store uh, owner behind the counter in a gun oh, store wow. anyway. Nice. And, uh, and they cut that, that part of it. Uh, so, uh, I, so I, just watched, um, I just watched the stranger and Harlan Coben has a, a scene. He doesn't say a word. He's, they come in there looking at him as he's typing on the computer and you think he's going to speak. And he never does. That's <laughs> cool. But it's like, that's really cool. That's clever. That's pretty clever. Yeah, no, I like we, that. So, so we'll we see. Are, yeah. Jack, we are super excited for, uh, for that TV show to come out. Yeah, for sure. We're also super excited for readers to get Savage Son in their hands. Yeah. It's a fantastic novel. Yes. You are a fantastic author. You're also a fantastic human being. Um, yes. God bless you for everything you've done for our country, for your service to the country, and for writing fantastic stories. Well, cheers. thank you so much. I appreciate your guys' support. It means a ton, and I love coming on in here. I almost want to write two books a year so we can do this more often. Hey, why not? not? Do it. On, we can be okay we with can, that. We can, we can just do a show about whiskey. I mean, it yeah. doesn't matter. <laughs> I, was about doing a, I, yeah, I was thinking about doing a whiskey Wednesday type thing. Uh, whiskey and firearms. Side, so, yeah. yeah whiskey just, and elk. They go together. Cheers, brother. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having Have a good me. one. All your support. You. Do Jack Carr on the crew reviews. That guy is not only an awesome person, he's an awesome writer. Savage Son, his latest novel, his third novel, comes out April 14th, tomorrow. If you haven't already got a copy, get a copy, read it, read it leave a review for him as well. Do those it. always help. Um, we want to thank Jack for coming on the show again. And boys, let's raise a glass. It was a fantastic interview with Jack. As always, cheers. Cheers, boys. Thank you.